basically like pathology good, neurodiversity paradigm good, good, bad, whatever. Uh, there's also criticisms of the neurodiversity paradigm as well that are worth highlighting. Uh, some people are fearful that they might lose disability support and access if uh, we push for full difference, no challenge kind of storylines. Uh, certain individuals might lose uh, some of those uh, benefits that do support their genuine disability that they do have. Um, and it's, it's similar to like the second point. And uh, also on the third front, uh, the neurodiversity paradigm also really at the end of it, there's a lot of us who might know someone who is autistic who might always need constant support. And most often that person is autistic and then they also have probably like two or three or four or five other like readily recognizable conditions that are also recognized similarly as a disability. It's a very clunky like umbrella term that's mostly subjective, like a sort of like early intervention diagnostics certain eye tracking tests, other things. Uh, there, there's not like a fully agreed upon biomarker or neurocorrelate for being like, yes, this person is for sure autistic. It's always at the discretion of a professional for the time being, short of very few limited, like kind of quantifiable metrics. Um, so we just want to be sensitive that if we're pushing, you know, these people are just different. We just don't want to erase the fact that these, some people do indeed have disabilities, no matter the context. They might just simply be very deeply challenged physiologically, motor, cognitively, anything. And we'll go over quick um, uh, some of the comorbidities in the population, which are going to be really relevant when we get to some of the discussions about like the actual intervention approaches. Um, Firstly, this is the most recent numbers. These numbers just keep going up and up. But one in 45 people is autistic in the U.S. Uh, these numbers are higher in the U.S. than abroad. The WHO numbers are about one in 100. Most people think that that's purely a matter of there's less diagnostics happening elsewhere. Here in the U.K., we kind of lead with early intervention and on and on. Um, but it's just to state that like one in 45 people, it's like one in every classroom and a half in America, there's an autistic person. Um, and if you calculate that out, you know, somewhere between like 80 to 100 and something million of us in the world out there. Uh, and most of those are adults, and most of those are hidden from view, either because of stigma or because of like limitations in terms of what they're capable of executing. But down the line, we get dealt uh, not the best hands. Uh, these are wide ranges. They're pulled from uh, the uh, series of review articles from the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. So when we say something like up to 84%, it's like a, a meta-analysis of a lot, a lot of papers. So obviously take that as it were. It's not to say like 84% of autistic people are depressed right now. Uh, but there's, it's just to say that like, as we compare any of these statistics down the line, anxiety, you know, 36 to 84, uh, OCD up to 20%, eating disorder up to 24%, social anxiety up to 50%, ADHD anywhere from 30 to 80% with a lot of confusing blurry overlaps. Um, and probably most significant for what we're going to talk about today is PTSD overlap, which is about 8x more likely in autistic populations. And a lot of people in our group will come in and be like, I just have CPTSD, I don't have autism, but you guys all seem like me, can I hang out here? <laughs> and we're like, oh yeah, you seem like us too. Uh, yeah, the world's traumatizing for us a bit. So, you know, at, at the end of it, there's, there's an infinite number of articles I'll point you towards later in the talk. Like, I'm not concerned with, like, the origin of these things necessarily, like, at, or what your philosophy is on trauma-informed care versus, you know, somatic healing versus all these things. It's just to say that, like, any one little kind of, you know, challenge that we might have, any way that we fall out of, like, the rhythm of, like, the social norms right in the early phases of our lives, as soon as we start to enter that, like, period of being othered, that sets us on the trajectory of, like, everything else as far as addiction and life expectancy being, like, I don't know, like 50 or something right now, maybe lower, and suicide rate being, like, four or five times more likely uh, for us as well. It's just down the line, we're challenged. Um, and unless we have some sort of socially intelligent solution for how to address those challenges, these intervention tools for the time being are, are really prized by a lot of people uh, for how potentially cost effective they can be if they're implemented in community care. If people can just have one nice day in the park and be like, I think it's worth living though, I'm going to try to figure out how to do that now. Like those days can be deeply meaningful for people. Um, and you know, it's not going to change the whole world or change the system that they're trying to keep up with. But for a lot of people, especially in the sort of like suicidal intervention kind of crowd, you know, just having that moment of relief, that moment of quiet internally, a moment of peace, a moment of beauty, sometimes
sometimes that could be more therapeutic than whatever rational solution we could provide them, just to have that taste of it. So we'll get more into like the kind of function of that. Um, and then, and as far as intersectionality, I, I acknowledge my own blind spots here, as well as the broader field of autism research, that there's, like a lot of other things, there's not as much attention paid to black, indigenous, people of color populations. They're less often diagnosed in general, less often to receive services. By percentage, uh, white children are approximately 90% more likely than black children. This is U.S. statistics. And 65% more likely uh, than Hispanic children to be diagnosed as autistic. And um, uh, some research points towards the notion that it's not just a matter of um, like socioeconomic status and access, also these cultural factors, like someone who speaks English as a second language, people might not recognize that there's another layer of processing challenge because they're too distracted by their language to begin with, that the, like autism in an ESL so is going to be like triple missed, or it could also work in reverse, where like these things are creating layers of confounding. Uh, kind of diagnostics and so it creates a little bit of obscurity as far as like how do we ultimately label an individual which really only translates to what course of care will that individual receive um, which really when we get to the PTSD and such uh, you know for a lot of people it's a lot more helpful to get trauma-informed care than it would be to get like uh, behavioral therapies as an adult or something like this um, even if they haven't been to war, trauma-informed care can still teach you about your body, your nervous system, things are going to be super helpful. Um, we'll talk about that later. And lastly, I'll clip you guys with a little bit of vocab, uh, and then I'll open it up just to like two or three comments, and then we'll just take like a quick like five-minute break, bio break, water break kind of thing. Um, but some words that we have tossed around, we talked about it, neurodiversity, just the concept that neurological differences, like those seen in autism, ADHD, dyslexia, should be celebrated or at least recognized as natural forms of diversity. That the neurodiversity paradigm is specifically talking about the perspective uh, that values that diversity of human uh, neurological function rather than seeing it as a deficit. And the neurodiversity movement more broadly is just anyone and anything that advocates for acceptance and inclusion of people with neurological differences and challenges that dominant medical pathologizing model of disability. Neurodivergent is a term that's kind of been kind of um, come about as a sort of like response instead of being kind of, kind of called like disorderly or atypical. Like neurodivergent is sort of like a prideful reclamatory phrasing. Uh, we just had a neurodivergent psychedelic conference recently. It's kind of like in speak for like, I've also been called other and I'm okay with that and we can call each other that, we're cool. Um, and neurotypical, I almost don't ever really use it because I think it's a mythical term. Like neurodivergent has a cultural space, but like there's no, who's, I don't know if I'm starting like a normals group, but like, <laughs> like, like it doesn't make, any, doesn't make any sense. So like I don't really use it, but like turn, like papers and studies, if you go back, some of the papers we'll talk about, we'll talk about typically developing adults, uh, which is essentially like, I don't know, you have to like walk through raindrops and not get something in the DSM. Like if you grieve for more than three months, you have a condition. Like there's so many things that like that divergence umbrella could still touch and it's really just a culturally held term. It's not medical. Um, it's just like for cult cultural relevance. They're, they're um, talking about combining straight, pr straight pride day and neurotypical day into one celebration. Yeah, and there's a lot of overlaps. And it's just, again, it's, it's, yeah, when you start to reflect, it can seem kind of wonky. Um, and I've even seen pushes to go beyond neurodiversity into psi diversity, which is to say all people have psychological diversity, like let's move on. Um, and you know, but for the time being, just as it would be with like a feminist movement, whatever, there's this offsetting energy of like spotlighting those who have been othered for the time being as we all kind of come back to wholeness as like a collective. Um, and you'll see terms like neurotype as in like what type of brain functioning you might have, cross neurotype. Some studies will mention that throughout, like someone with autism communicating with a non-autistic person, there's more dissonance in those kinds of instances. We'll cover some of that as well. Um, but before we go any further, again, I just want to give you guys like five minutes. Also, admittedly, give myself five minutes as well, just to kind of rest my breath for a second. Uh, the bathroom isn't back, uh, and I know there's quite a lot of us here. And also, feel free to step out. Also, this food is just here uh, for all of you guys. Uh, if you haven't, and finally, if you haven't yet ordered uh, foods yet, this is kind of like last call to put in your order for the 8 o'clock snack break that we'll be doing. So take five, and I'll meet you back here at that.